Great to see you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Good to join you. Commissioner, it's always nice to see you. It's great to be with you. I brought you a copy of my book this morning, but it's not signed. I thought I'd wait and sign it to see how this morning yeah, goes. Yeah, you may want to wait on that. on that, exactly. <laughs> Up yours since you only Todd Staples may be the way this goes. <laughs> And I appreciate, like, like Senator Hudson on The Daily Show last night, you promoting your book, I may not be as nice to you as he was to her. So we'll actually, <laughs> we'll actually see. I want to begin with a serious topic, uh, West. Uh, big story in the Dallas Morning News you may not have seen today, an investigation through open records the Dallas Morning News did. They found that there are 44 fertilizer plants in the state of Texas that have at least 10,000 pounds of, of ammonium nitrate uh, uh, stored. Uh, two have as much as the plant in West did, which is more than 500,000 pounds, and one is within driving distance of here in the Hill Country, one's in the Panhandle. The TCEQ was asked about whether this is possibly a good thing, since that's the chemical that many people think caused the explosion, and the answer was basically, we do pollution, we don't do chemicals. Mm -hmm. When Commissioner Shaw was here, Chairman Shaw was here a couple weeks ago, his response was, talk to the Texas state chemist. Well, people have talked to the Texas state chemist. He said, not our job. There's a lot of this going on. And in the meantime, that plan exploded. It was a horrible tragedy, and I think many people would like to know who owns this. Farmers are often the... Uh, in this equation, you own farmers as the Ag Commissioner. Could you talk about this? Does your agency have anything to do with this? And how should we think about this? Well, first of all, nobody owns farmers, they can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, themselves are a pretty independent bunch. We owe it to the victims and their families to do a very thorough investigation of what caused the fire, what circumstances led to the just massive explosion. We owe it to every Texan and all Americans to do that. Um, the reality is while there may be 44 sites with ammonium nitrate there today, thousands and thousands more hazardous materials go up and down our highways every All day. The time, right? yeah. Airplanes take off and land every day, very dangerous circumstances. That plant was there for over 50 years without incident. Right. Uh, we need to get the facts on what caused this and then determine what needs to be done. That's the approach that we need to take. We always need to look for bigger and better ways to do things. Right. And, and I've seen the tragedy firsthand and it is very, it is a disaster of major proportions. Shouldn't a state agency, someone in state government, step forward and say whether or not we owned this before, we own this now? I believe the Office of State Chemist is the regulatory agency, but... but that, that, that's news to the Office of State Chemist based on what I've read well, in the papers. I, 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 well, the way I see this is that people don't know really what happened yet. Was it a, you know, and so you need to get the answers to that to know what to do, but it, I, there's a commitment across the board from everyone, agriculture included. The products that are used there are, are what makes the salad available on your plate. Right. Uh, it, it is something that has been a part of production agriculture, making food available. So we need to investigate. We need to find out. And then I believe if changes need to be made, the legislature will take a strong role. I will, as Commissioner of Agriculture, look into what needs to be done right. and to leave no stone unturned because uh, we owe it to those families. All right. So that story in the news uh, today, another story that was in the paper today in the New York Times was about hydraulic fracturing and water. You may have seen this uh, story off of a report from the nonprofit group Ceres that talked about the balance between, on the one hand, use of water and fracking. Texas was actually part of the story. And on the other hand, the fact that, as you well know, we're very strained in terms of our water resources in the state of Texas. This story acknowledged, a report acknowledges, that we're not using as a percentage of our available water very much for fracking purposes, but it raised some concerns about whether in some places where we have a kind of frack versus farm tension over use of water, it, it could be an issue. I know in LaSalle and Dimmitt counties, to name two, mm -hmm. there, this has been an issue. Uh, would you speak about that again? You know, you are, as Commissioner of Agriculture, if you don't own farmers, you at least advocate for farming and agriculture. Do we need to tell people in the fracking industry back off a little bit at this moment, given the fact that we have such problems with water, or can this balance be properly struck? Oh, it can absolutely be properly structured so that we can have affordable energy and we can have the water that we need. When we start looking at either our solutions, we, get, yeah. we, we, we marginalize ourselves and we can't do that. Uh, every four minutes, the amount of water that's used to frack a well in the Eagleford Shell flows past the city of Laredo to put it in context about what's being used. Yeah. So, but technology is rapidly advancing where reuse of water can be done, yeah. uh, using it options other than water to frack those wells. Um, we know that low cost natural gas has been fabulous for our state, the energy production, the jobs that are created. That doesn't mean that we can't continue to look for new and better ways, right. and I, we're going to do that. The, the tension between fracking and farming is only one bit of tension that has emerged in these days 
of water crisis. The other is uh, between farmers and cities. Uh, you read a lot about how people in the farming community in Texas are concerned that people in the cities are using too much water to water their lawns, they're being uh, greedy about their use of water, that they feel like it's their right to basically do whatever they want. Uh, again, talk about that. Do we have enough water for people in the cities to do whatever they want pretty much and still have enough water for ag? We don't have enough water for anyone in Texas yeah. today and we're rapidly approaching an even more serious crisis than we face today. Um, our, our water policy needs to recognize that we cannot ration and restrict our wet growth. We, we, we can't ration water in the cities and expect to accommodate the millions of new people that are going to be moving to Texas, that are moving to Texas and that will be here in the coming decades. We cannot limit water for agricultural use, but we need to continue to invest in water conservation, yeah. new technologies. One of the statistics that often gets failed to be reported is that since 1974 to 2010, agricultural water use has declined by 42% in the state, yep. all while yields have doubled in cer certain circumstances and risen rapidly in others. So ag is doing its part. Ag's doing its part. Uh, you know I've been a part of a statewide water conservation campaign that the private industry in the urban areas came to me, the nursery and landscape industry, the retail association, right. and the water authorities called TexasWaterSmart.com because conservation is the uh, cheapest form of new water, saving water that we don't have to uh, use unnecessarily. So when you say we can't ration our way to growth, Commissioner, you know there are cities all over the state, including a number in West Texas, which happen to be doing quite well on the energy side, incidentally, mm -hmm. where they have had pretty draconian, uh, those, that's not a judgment, but it just is, draconian, is. water restrictions on the use by uh, private homes of water, whether it's watering or pool use or kind of what, what have you, all the various ways residences use water. Are you saying if we can't ration our way to growth that those cities are in the wrong in putting those restrictions on? What I'm saying is those cities are doing what they need to be doing, looking yeah. for new water resources. We have to make certain that we can move water. Sometimes the issue is not enough water to be able to, uh, to move that water to yeah. where it needs to be. And well, the worst drought in a hundred year history obviously sh showcased our serious need to focus on new water planning. Right. We know the bill went down in the legislature earlier this week, uh, setting money aside for yeah. a dedicated purpose to, uh, to make certain we're sending the right signal. I meet with businesses pretty regularly, those yeah. that want to relocate to Texas, those that want to expand in Texas, and every site selection committee or, or group that comes in representing them has a long laundry list of questions. Two of those questions are, one is, what are we going to do to have an educated and skilled and available workforce? Right. But the second question that's on every group's list is, what is Texas going to do to meet its water needs? Right. So as we're moving forward, we, we have to send that signal that we are going to do that, do it in an, in an accountable way, right. make certain that the dollars are used appropriately, uh, and that we have some transparency in that process. Did, you know, did, did we do an adequate job of that on Monday, Commissioner? I mean, what I, what I saw was a plan that came forward from leadership, from Chairman Ritter, to take money out of the rainy day fund, which is overflowing thanks to the benef you know, benefits of the energy boom in Texas. Uh, uh, and yet from the right and from the left, whether it was a joint effort or it was coincidental that they both picked at this, they, they brought down the funding mechanism for this water plan. I mean, we may get there. We may do it. But There's time to say. If you were still Representative Staples, would you have voted aye on that funding mechanism? Well, it was killed before it got to the Oh, vote. no, 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 no. <laughs> Here, I'll, here's I'll, I'll sit with you, you until you answer. Tell I want to tell you what yeah. Lieutenant Governor yeah. Staples would do. He, <clears throat> Obviously, there's some concern about the approach. Alan's doing a great job. We've yeah. got great leaders that are focused on the need to have new water resources. Right. But there is concern and there's valid concern. Last session, the voters were asked to approve a $6 billion bond package. Mm -hmm. I don't believe any of those bonds have been issued yet, but it was put forward and voted on. And so right. I think there's just some concern about are you going to use the rainy day fund? Is it going to be general revenue? I would like to see that be general revenue dollars. If in order to reserve those rainy day funds. So you would, have been, you would have been with Chairman Creighton then that we, we have a mechanism to cut the budget to, to replace the dollars that would come out of the rainy day fund with GR funds. I, I think our Senate and House negotiators need to get with our appropriators and find out really where, what room do we have on general revenue dollars and let's use those first. If we don't have enough there, maybe it needs to be part and parcel, some general revenue and some rainy day fund. But, it, but we have a situation today where I think voters are concerned that you have money that's being set aside and it hasn't been articulated that if this doesn't happen, if the legislature doesn't appropriate these dollars, uh, what projects won't be funded? 
We need to be talking about it in real terms that the city of Midland won't be able to do their deal or, or, or you know, San Antonio won't be. And that's, those are the terms that we need to be articulating that. The debate earlier this week yeah. talked about $53 billion in debt. I think that alarms many people. Well, it talked about, a, it talked about a $53 billion state water plan over 50 years, of which only the first $2 million would come out of the rainy day fund. Now, rainy day fund is full, near the cap. Right to start a revolving loan fund so that there'd be projects that would get jump started, that money would be paid. I mean, I'm trying to understand whether you oppose that mechanism on its face or not. I strongly support dedicating funding for a state water plan to make certain we have the tools for communities to use to get these projects going. Right. But not out of the rainy day fund. <clears throat> I'm saying my first preference would be to use general revenue dollars. Right. If those dollars aren't sufficient, then look at the rainy day fund. But when you I think, there, I think the frustration that conservatives have, there hasn't been a strong enough discussion about what is the appropriate balance in the ready day fund. We need to make certain that we do maintain a strong bond rating, that the capacity is there to respond to disasters that we know we have, hurricanes, wildfires, droughts that we right. face. And you'd get a much bigger buy-in from conservatives if on the front end those discussions were occurring in the terms that people have confidence that it would be there. So you and, you and your governor are on opposite sides on this issue. I, I, I don't know. I do. If you can say Governor's that for, for it. sure. I do. Governor's yeah, well, for it. Governor if, has if, said expressly. If the governor is saying use that without consideration of using general revenue first and dedicating those dollars, if, if they are available, then we are. That's exactly right. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised but that I, you're opposed. You, you're on the opposite side of Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst on this as well. And his characterized his position as just used two and a half billion out of the rainy day. Well, fund. Governor uh, Governor Dewhurst has said grace over the Senate's plan, which was unanimous. Uh, I don't think he was absent that day uh, to take 5.7 billion out, I believe, in total for a to for a combination of water transportation and public education funding out of the rainy day fund. So uh, less than that amount needs to be used and we need to use general revenue first. Are you opposed to all of those priorities being funded in part out of the rainy day fund, transportation, public ed, as well as water? Well, those are our priorities for the state. It's just a matter of where do we get the dollars and are we having the discussion first about what the sufficient level of the rainy day fund needs to be. Yeah. You have buy-in. If, if that needs to occur, people just aren't convinced that it is. The members of the legislature aren't and the people of Texas don't really know because well, some, some, members seem not, some members seem not to be. The Democrats seem to be convinced that water is a priority, but they actually want to tack public education on as well as a line item, and they may or may not get the opportunity to do that. It seems like there's a smaller group of folks, conservatives, that's their legitimate point of view, which is fine, yeah. that they just don't think that the rainy day fund is the best mechanism. So I'm not sure that if you just did a straight up or down vote, removing the education piece of this, the majority of the House may actually be for this. Well, they may be, and you've had, you know, 20 some odd days left in the session, right. and they'll be working in conference committees, continuing to talk how to do these things, yeah. so that we can send that right, right message that we're very serious about meeting the future needs of our state. Com Commissioner, I'm going to put you on the spot because you are, we'll talk about the Lieutenant Governor's race in a second, but you intend to run for what is a very important job. You're going to have purview over a lot of these issues. If you think that money could come out of GR, cut the budget for us now. What would you see get less funding in order to provide the revenue for those well, the introduced parts. bills that were introduced has general revenue left available, both a couple of two and a half billion or so in the House version and three plus billion in the Senate version. So I'm, there's not saying that you don't have capacity there. Well, I heard Sylvester Turner and others say that if you want to take this money out of general revenue fund, you're going to cut pay for state troopers, you're going to cut public education, yeah. you're going to cut a bunch of programs that have seen some dollars restored from the last session. Are you prepared to go to the people and say it's more important that we cut those programs than take money out of an over full rainy day fund? The, that's really not the discussion. I know what Sylvester said on the floor, and yeah. maybe the way that the in, the amendment was written, that's his interpretation of what happened. Not yours. I'm not addressing the amendment that Brandon brought forward Monday. Right. I am addressing the philosophy of how I think we need to be approaching this. What and when it comes to reducing spending, absolutely, we need to always be looking for efficiencies and better ways to do things. I've done that in my agency. Right. The legislature has moved programs to the Department of Agriculture. We have administered those programs with less people and lower administrative costs. That's the responsibility of every unit of government right. so that we can make certain we have a priority. And education needs to be our, our number one. The, the, what you heard last session and what I think you hear again this session is if it's not raining now, when will it be raining enough to use the rainy day fund? Because the, the, the water crisis, the transportation funding needs that we have in this, I mean, put public education to the side for a second. I think people are more willing to have a discussion about whether there's a justification for using one-time funds out of the rainy day fund for public ed. But just on water and transportation, enormous ticket items, 
dispute over exactly how much they, they cost. But we're in crisis situation, at least on water for sure, if not on transportation. If not now, on the rainy day fund, when? If we have the money and the general revenue, we need to use that first. And then look at other alternative means if we don't have sufficient funds to do what we need to do. We, we have a, a real challenge in our state today because people have seen a lack of planning. Uh, the rainy day funds should not be used as a gravy train to go out and fund projects because of lack or poor planning on the legislature's part. That's the frustration that you see. And th that's what we need to make certain that we avoid in this process. When voters know that diversions continue to occur in the budget process, it gives a lack of credibility for the legislature to just automatically default and say there's a pot of money in the rainy day fund. Right. Let's use that without having to make the hard decisions. And I think that's kind of the disconnect that we're hearing today and people are seeing approaching this issue from different levels is that the legislature hasn't done the responsible things they need to to get serious about ending those diversions, to be making yeah. certain they're transparent about the way those dollars are used, yeah. about how dollars are collected for one purpose, then they're never used for that purpose. You, you that's, mentioned, that, that's a source of frustration. I think you're correct to identify the diversions issue as one that is on the minds of a lot of people, Democrats and Republicans this session. The governor actually put a stake in the ground on the question of diverting money for one purpose away from that purpose to another purpose in his state of the state speech. And there's been some legislation to try to address that. But let me ask you a question about that. Again, since you want to be lieutenant governor, and these, would be in your, these issues would be in your hands. If you take money that has been appropriated for one purpose away from the purpose for which it's been diverted. So the governor talked about, for instance, the money that was going away, you know, going to DPS funding, I think, in the state of the state speech. We want to put it back into the original purpose for which it was intended. You're going to basically create a hole over here by, by putting that money back for the purpose it was intended originally. You're not going to defund DPS, say, in that example. You're going to have to just basically find that money somewhere else in the budget. This is a pig and a snake. It goes down in one place. It comes back in another. Isn't the diversion question really still going to create a budget problem one way or the other? Well, number one, that's assuming that that bucket of water is the same amount of water that we're going to be able to have for the next few years. We know our economy is going to grow. We right. know we're going to expand. And we need leadership to early on in the process get in front of that and make that the priority of our spending so that you don't end up in a crisis situation, that you do fund our public safety needs of the state, that you are funding our education needs, and that you're taking care of our transportation needs. Those things can be done, but it can't be done if you do it in the middle of session and if you don't have a thoughtful approach on how you're going to get there. And transparent all the way. A a absolutely. You know, there, there, there's a greater level of awareness today than at any other time, I think, in our history of people getting access to information. Yeah. That's a good thing. We see people, enga people engaged. We see people asking questions. And that leads to a more robust debate, a better and open process. Uh, it allows people to call out someone that may not be telling the whole truth. I think the people of Texas and across America, they don't want bills passed and then read. I don't think they want backroom deals done. They want things done so then in you're a lot of days. So then you're opposed to the three mulligans that the legislature took this session where they voted on bills that they apparently didn't read and then came back and said, wait a minute, never mind? You know, um, it, it is a legislative process. You've been they, in it. I've been in it. Mistakes happen. You need to read that legislation. I, my staff and I didn't get much sleep during the legislative process because I try to read every bill make certain I know what's in there, and if I don't, I vote no. Right. Let's talk about immigration. We'll come back to the lieutenant governor thing here in a couple minutes, I promise. But as you know, we finally moved to a place in this country where comprehensive immigration reform is in the on-deck circle, if not actually up at bat. We've had the Gang of Eight in the Senate put forward a plan. I talked to Congressman Carter from Round Rock, who's part of the House's Gang of Eight on Monday in San Antonio. He wouldn't say exactly what's in that plan, except to say that it would be different from the Senate plan. This has also been an issue that you've uh, in, you know, taken on as one of your causes since you've been in office. Uh, what do you think about the Senate plan from what you've heard? What do you think that the ultimate plan that Congress considers ought to be? I'm very glad that Congress is attempting to solve this broken and antiquated problem. Yeah. You know that I was paying attention to it long, long before, before the November outcome elections. of the elections that others woke up and said maybe we need to look at things a little differently. Right. And I got involved in this process because landowners sought me out who were being chased off their property by violent drug cartel members. Uh, we need to be pro-legal immigration. We need to be welcoming to our nation. We need to not chase votes 
based on what your zip code is, what the color of your skin happens to be. We need to be having policy that allows everyone, regardless of the circumstances of your birth, to grow and succeed. Do you think the that's Senate, happening, Commissioner? You just said chasing votes on the basis I, of your skin I, color. Is that happening? I think the National Republican Party just spent $10 million on a study on trying to reinvent themselves. I think they don't need to be looking at reinventing themselves. They need to rededicate themselves to sound policies and sound principles that moves everyone forward. I think there's a communication problem today. We need to fix our failed immigration system. Our economy depends upon that. I said early on that the 11 to 20 million people here that I don't want a government big enough that can round up that many people. That government has failed to stop people at the border. Those individuals in our nation today are a big part of our economy. Right. I also want a system that doesn't encourage future unlawful entry into our country. The Gang of Eight bill today is full of flaws. First of all, the, it Senate, was, the, Senate, bill. the, the Senate bill that's being looked at today is full of flaws. First of all, it was written by labor union lawyers who are using the same failed methodology that was used in the 1986 bill that has yielded the results that we're in today. So if we adopt that as it's proposed, we shouldn't expect anything different in the next few Sen years. Senator Rubio and Senator Graham gave over themselves to the labor unions on this bill? The labor unions had much too much influence in developing the methodology and the writing of this bill. Something else that's wrong, the metrics that are being used to secure our border, it empowers the Department of Homeland Security, the same people who have said in California the border is a safe border, the same people that have continuously rebuffed our pleas for more resources in Texas and said the border is a safe and safer border, uh, it empowers them to determine when the border is safe and when these new triggers come into being. And I'll tell you a big flaw with it that I think we need to be pro-legal immigration. We have an immigration system that if you want to become a citizen of the United States, we welcome you. It's immigration, assimilation, and naturalization. Citizenship in this context is being used as a political poker chip. It's been used as convenient citizenship, and I think there's a better way. We have to keep in mind that the 11 to 20 million people that are in our nation today are not here because of a failed citizenship process. They're here because of a porous border and a failed guest worker program. I believe Congress, if they really wanted to fix things, could focus on those issues, get a bill passed, and let's create and let's and let's support our existing pathway to citizenship so today. So border, secu border security, border security, and guest worker program would be your would your priority. And, and what I mean by that, I was yeah. in a DPS helicopter in the middle of the night, observing as they were dispatching agents on the ground to interdict people in the middle of the night. Right. Pitch black. We're seeing figures on the screen. Right. I'm thinking, we don't know if our agents are going after heavily armed drug cartel members ready to do battle, right. or if they're going after someone uh, that's entering our country illegally, but they're otherwise looking for a job. We need to free up our law enforcement to go after the drug cartels right. and allow people to come into our country through a legal process so that we know who is here and we know when their visas expire. Congressman Carter told me on Monday he believes that the Gang of Eight bill from the Senate is amnesty. Do you believe it's Absolutely. amnesty? You believe it's an Absolutely. amnesty bill? The way that it's written, for instance, uh, some individuals in the bill can get their status corrected for a $100 fine, less than the price of a traffic ticket. So there's, there's nothing in there to say, use our legal system no that we want to create, no because there, right. there's no disincentive. Thank you. Right. You, you know, right. Commissioner, you talked about the need for border security, and I think this is a component of every good conversation about immigration reform, is what degree of border security. I know from reading the statistics that net migrations right now are at, are at a recent low, and that the Obama administration has deported more people than the Bush administration did. That tells me that maybe we don't have as much of a border security problem. If I'm just looking at those two statistics, maybe we don't have as much of a border security problem as some people say. That's because you're not looking at the full realm of statistics. Tell me you're what statistics I should be looking well, 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 do, 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 do you believe that the Obama, yes or no, has the Obama administration's number of deportations been higher than the Bush administration's? Uh, Yes. Okay, so why am I looking at Obama talking points then? That's, if that's a stat that we both agree with. Because is what unit of measurement is that to declare if we have a secure border or tell, not? Tell me, tell me a stat. Tell me a stat I should be looking at. Let me tell you a stat you're looking at. Yeah. The most recent fiscal year data by the Customs and Border Patrol right. indicates that apprehensions have gone up this last fiscal year over the other one. Uh, 1 1.7 million pounds of narcotics were confiscated in Texas alone this last fiscal year, 40% of the nation's total. 
230,000 pounds more than in California, Arizona, and New Mexico combined was confiscated within the state of Texas. Yep. In the Rio Grande Valley sector alone this last fiscal year, over 50% of the people that were apprehended were coming from countries other than Mexico. Uh, the apprehensions are not an indicator of a secure border right. when you have billions of dollars in illegal narcotics, human trafficking that are going across our border. It's very simple. If you'd like to come with me and tour farmers and ranchers' lands where their property is as brown as that floor yeah. because of the volumes of traffic. Right. I meet with border sheriffs. And they will tell me that drug cartels will send a group of people looking for a job across one part of a county. Yep. They themselves will call the law enforcement. Everyone rushes to that scene, and the drug cartels are moving undetected across our border. That's the reality of the porous border that we have today. The metrics are not there. And even the Obama administration is saying, yes, do more on border security now. Are they doing that for political reasons, or are they doing it because they know the border is insecure? They truthfully know that that is an insecure yep. border. Okay. Well, we have about five, or I'm going to take longer than we normally have, maybe 10 minutes left. I want to ask you about this race for Lieutenant Governor. Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst has said explicitly, I am 101% sure that I'm running for re-election. He's made staffing moves recently that people say this is an indication that he is serious about running for re-election. I had one of his aides tell me this morning, if you don't know whether he's running or not, talk to Mrs. Dewhurst. He is running for sure. <laughs> you have said in response to this, I am 202% sure that I'm running <laughs> for Lieutenant Governor. What is it about Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst that you're not afraid of? What is it about him that you find wanting that makes you challenge an incumbent. I mean, look, sure. Republican on Republican action is the only action we in the press have these days. <laughs> I know you're not doing this for me. I thank you. We want to get you writing plenty yeah. of material but to report on. What, what's wrong with Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst? Well, this race is not about uh, Dewhurst. It's not about any other candidate. It is about the future of Texas. And that's why I'm committed to running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we are at a turning point in our state. We have over a thousand people a day moving to the Lone Star State. I want those individuals to think like we do, not, us not start beginning to think like them. It's really about the Texas of tomorrow, and I don't want the Texas of tomorrow to look like the Illinois today or the, the mission of today or any other state. But if and you, but if you thought running, the Lieutenant Governor was doing a good job, you would not be running against him. I think it's always healthy to have fresh faces and fresh ideas. And this is about who can fight for the values and the interest and to move Texas forward in the way that we need to do that. And I think I am that person that is qualified, that is trained. I have a consistent conservative record. Anyone that chooses to get into this race, I look forward to a robust and vigorous debate. I want to have those frequently. I hope you will have us often and early and all across the state to talk about what our vision is and how to solve these problems because the people of Texas of today recognize that we are in a transition period. Battleground Texas is real. And for those that want a state where families are not trapped with debt, the, those that believe that our free market enterprise system and individual responsibility are core factors, I believe they have a record that offers delivering solutions under those terms. And, and I look forward to not only fighting for who's going to represent our values in the Republican primary, but in the general election on, on making certain that we recognize that a culture of dependency is not the direction that Texas needs to go. It's not the direction that our nation needs to go. What, 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 it, what is it about you and Lieutenant Governor that differs? I'm trying to understand how Lieutenant Governor Staples would be different than Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst. Had you been Lieutenant Governor this session, you've watched the session play out very closely. Tell me one area, please tell me more than one area, on which you and the Lieutenant Governor would have behaved differently. I'm not going to make this about he and I today. How can you not? Because you, you're running you, against an incumbent. Because he's only half committed as I am to running in this race right now. <laughs> <laughs> However, good, good, good one, however, Commissioner. Um, uh, however. Yeah, but come on. I mean, you're running look, against the incumbent. Look, how, can, how can we not take this as a frontal assault on, your, on his record by you? Because it's about the future of Texas. This seat does not belong to anyone. Uh, the people, it belongs to the people of Texas, and those are the individuals that I'm going to be talking so to. So you're not going to talk about Dewhurst during the primary? We, you're not going to attack I, him? It, you're not going to try to Ted Cruz when him? We're, when we're on the campaign trail, yeah. I will be very vigorous about my vision for Texas. I will have no hesitancy in discussing 
contrasting and comparing records about the future of this state. Is he insufficiently conservative? Today. Is he insufficiently conservative? Who all is in this race? Is he insufficiently conservative? As Ted I have Cruz no, repeatedly I have no claimed. question in my mind, or the record reflects that I'm the most conservative person mentioned in this race about moving forward. Who who is a problem solver? who doesn't compromise my conservative values, uh, but who also understands we have a big constituency in this state. Yeah. We need to be looking at these, these, these solutions. And, you know, we, 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 there are always bright people. The smartest people are not those that serve in the state capitol. They're hardworking families all around the state, and that's who I'm talking to. So had you been Lieutenant Governor Staples in the 2011 session, would you have said grace over cutting public education to the degree that public ed was cut? Uh, as lieutenant governor, I would not have raised taxes. That would, have therefore, th that would have therefore required us to make spending reductions. And uh, there were efficiencies that have been gained through those reductions. Public education had to take reductions. No agency of government, I right. will approach this, no agency of government is immune from looking for savings and looking for reductions right. when they need to be. But here's the way I see public education today. We have a group that is focused on quality education, uh, spending as a unit of success. We have another group that's looking on making cuts, accountability, and efficiencies. I don't think those philosophies have to be mutually exclusive. Right. I think we have to bring those groups together. I want a public education system where parents want to send their kids to school in. I think that's, that needs to be our goal. We need to measure success not by spending, but by how many students are graduating from our high schools around the state. How many students no longer need remedial training in math and reading in our community colleges. Right. Those are the real units of measurement, and we can't get sidetracked on uh, spending alone. If spending alone was the answer, then Washington, D.C. schools will be turning out an Einstein uh, every day. So the fact that we've gone from 41st in per student spending on public education back before the 2011 session to 49th on per student spending this session. Uh, compared to the other states, I think only two states, 50 states plus D.C., spend less on public ed per student than we do. That is not of concern to you? Uh, it's of concern with me when dollars don't go into the classroom. It's of concern to me when we don't pay teachers adequately enough to attract bright minds to teach our kids. Right. And th that's the way we need to be looking at this. And it also greatly concerns me when we have a culture in our, in our state that refuses to look at new models of doing things. Technology is going to lower the per unit cost. Right. And if we think that we just have to continue the same old me methodology, then we're in trouble fiscally, we're in trouble financially. Right. And so we have to have leaders that, that appreciate public education. I'm a product of public education. I had teachers that carried me to the first inaugural parade of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. I was only in kindergarten at that time. time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But, I, I mean, they, they carried me one student to participate in FFA contests yeah. uh, at, at an, on the national level. So uh, I believe in that, but I also believe that we need to have accountability in that process. And we cannot blindly approach this to say that if we're asking for efficiencies, we're asking for accountability, that that is contrary to asking for quality in our system. Would you have been, as Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst this session, in support of a plan to introduce vouchers into the conversation on public education? You know, I think giving parents choice is a good thing. But there are a lot of places along that continuum, Commissioner, that choice could reside. It could reside with open enrollment within public school districts. It could be. And no public money migrating out of a system, or it could reside in vouchers or it could be somewhere in between. Please take a position. I, I'm taking a position. I support giving parents choice in public education and sending their children to private schools. Mm -hmm. I support not leaving children trapped in low performing schools and not giving them the same opportunities that you and I or we all could give our children in this room. Right. So I think we need to be looking at that. But that is not going to solve the problems of failing five million school kids in Texas today. Many children whose parents don't even care. They don't, they don't even choose to send their children to school. They just, they just do. So we need to not think that that alone is going to solve our problems. And I, I don't think we should be discussing the future of education as parental choice only or vouchers only, because that's not going to get the job done. Let me, quickly ask, broader than that. let me quickly ask you one more question that might be in your hands as the head of the Texas Senate, if that should happen. And that is the expansion of Medicaid. You know, a lot of discussion about whether you call it expanding Medicaid or euphemistically leveraging federal dollars. <laughs> The fact is we have a problem of 28.8% of our population, 6.2 million people in the state are uninsured. 
And that doesn't count the underinsured or underserved. We've always had a, a leading place among the 50 states for going back probably 20 years in, in terms of this, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, governor has been resolute in saying not only no, but hell no, we're not going to expand Medicaid. There have been some attempts in the legislature to kind of wire around that opposition and see if we can't get access yeah. to those dollars. So you're now Lieutenant Governor Staples, and you're confronted with the challenge of, uh, of 6.2 million people in the state who are uninsured. You have the opportunity to expand Medicaid. What do you do? I would oppose the expansion of Medicaid under the current system that we have today because it's failed us. We know that enrollment growth has increased by about 135 percent over two decades, while costs have risen 445 percent. So we cannot continue a system that is doomed for failure, both at the national level and the state level. I think the governor is right to put his foot down and say we've got to find a Texas solution that doesn't put us on a trajectory of uh, unending spending when you only have three and ten new doctors that are, or three and ten doctors that are accepting new Medicaid patients. Yeah. That's not a model that's going to meet the needs. And further, states that have used this model, it has not impacted our, uh, their, their uninsured rates. So we need a Texas solution. Uh, if the federal do, do you dollars, have one? Do you have one, by the way? Because I ask a lot of people yeah, who are opposed uh, to expanding Medicaid. I know what yeah. they're against. I ask them what they're for, and I don't really hear anything specific. Can you I tell am, me something you're for? Because I'm not in a position today to have to put forth a plan. I don't have a specific plan, but I have a general plan that would accept the federal dollars in a block grant form that does not encumber uh, and tie Texas to a Titanic Medicaid program. You think they're going to be offered with no strings? The federal government is going to have to fundamentally change the way that it does things. Yeah. And they're going to have to look for new ways. States are the best incubators. We know that states try things and we see their failures and they go a different way. Our, our um, margins tax, I don't see any states rushing to emulate the Texas model today. And so I think that's an example of how we can do things different. Would you be up for blowing up the margins tax? I think we need to look for ways to uh, reduce that burden and expand jobs. Would, in would Texas. you be yes or no? Would yes, you be I look for ways to limit the margins tax, get rid of it, or reduce its impact. If we can tie that to job expansion in Texas, that's a good model. It works. Okay. Last session, we kept spending within our revenue. Illinois didn't. Illinois had to appropriate $300 million to keep the businesses they had. People look to jump ship. We don't want that for Texas. We can find a better way. I want to bring the audience into this, and I could go on with you here for about another hour. Let me just ask you quickly, is there any circumstance, any circumstance at all, that will keep you from running for lieutenant governor? I'm running for lieutenant governor There is, no, there is nothing that could happen between I don't now see and it as we sit here today. I mean, I'm in. I've got, I, and the reason why is this. For the last two years, yeah. I've traveled Texas. I've listened to people all across our state. Uh, I've developed a great grassroots level of support. People are excited about the future of Texas, but they also know there are some serious choices that have to be made, and I'm committed to fighting for their values and interests. All right, Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Todd Staples, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Always fun. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. Let's do questions.